government says the head of the United Nations Peacekeeping Missions Human Rights Division has been asked to leave the country within 48 hours after being declared personal non grata. In a statement on Sunday, it said the decision to expel a V official was connected to his allegedly biased choice of civil society witnesses for United Nations Security Council briefing on Mali, the most recent of which was held on January 27. The government accuses him of engaging in destabilizing and subversive acts in flagrant violation of the principles and obligations that must be observed by United Nations uh, officials and any diplomat uh, accredited to Mali in accordance with uh, the relevant international conventions. Meanwhile, colleague Burkina Faso's Prime Minister in a visit to neighboring Mali this week has suggested the two countries form a federation to boost their economic growth, but nations are based in jihadist insurgencies and are run by by military officials who have turned away from France, the former colonial ruler. What analysis and what impact we are discussing the two in today's program? This is Views on the Continent. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us uh, this day on your Pan-African Television Africa Media. It's always a pleasure uh, knowing that you're watching us. We call it pleased to be here. We are uh, always here to discuss Africa and to take a keen look on issues affecting the continent. Today we're looking at Mali and uh, the fact that Malian authorities have expelled MINUSMA uh, official for destabilization attempts. It's what we are focusing on this uh, afternoon. In a statement, my interim government says the head of the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission's Human Rights Division has been asked to leave the country within 48 hours. We're currently discussing uh, the fact that uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, both countries are eyeing a federation. What would this mean for both countries headed by uh, Junta, who have part ways with uh, their former colonial masters, France? That's our topic of discussion for today. We are pleased. Uh, to know that you can always join us on our Facebook page. The program is being streamed live on Facebook. Leave us your comments there. We shall have them read during the program. And of course, we have uh, those who will be joining us to discuss this topic this afternoon. We have Mr. Tagia from Hong Kong. He is a human rights advocate. Mr. Tagia, we're pleased to have you. Hello, Luis. It's a pleasure to join this program uh, this afternoon. Um, what's that point? What's that point? Euh, buenas tardes a nuestros amigos de Guinée équatoriale. Bonsoir à tous nos amis les Maliens où que vous soyez dans le monde. Nous sommes avec vous et nous allons discuter ce sujet ensemble. So thank you again, Luis. It's a pleasure for me to discuss this topic. Thank you very much, Mr. Tagia, for accepting our invitation. We have uh, Kiki Lomo uh, Shodeko. She's a senior risk and security analyst. She joining us via Zoom from uh, Nigeria. Kiki Lomo, we're pleased to have you on the program. Hello, Bit. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. We could also have Mr. Elijah Enoku. He is a researcher with Leeds University on Africa Development. Mr. Elijah, we're pleased to have you on the program. Thanks for having me one more time, Luis, and uh, hopefully we're going to have a fruitful discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation, of course. Uh, let's begin with you, Mr. Tagia from Hong Kong. We're looking at the fact that uh, Malian authorities expelled United Nations official over what they describe as destabilization attempt. And this comes to add to the already deteriorating relationship we we'll see in Mali. Uh, Malian authorities are having with external uh, partners now. How did you welcome this, uh, the fact that uh, Malian government says United Nations official uh, has been expelled for destabilization attempt? You should follow that information. Uh, do you think Malian government stands a uh, on the right side on trying to, you know, put together the country and uh, saying that the United Nations official is a personal non -grata. How did you welcome that? Yes, please. I uh, agree with all of you guys to stand in admiration for what is happening, what the, the way ahead Mali is taking. And uh, that gave me also an opportunity to really come, because what happened really in Mali, it started with the human rights, the chief of the human rights of the, of the United Nations that has been declared persona non, non grata in Mali. 
And that brings me back to what I always said on uh, when I have the opportunity to say it. What the West did at the end of the Second World War, at the creation of the Human Rights Commission, is just cashing them up now. All the wrongs that they brought there is cashing them because they made it in a way to carry on serving them while at the end of the war, all the countries were affected. Africa was was affected Africa that went to help France to get out of the war as uh, in victory uh, was affected all the continents were affected it's good that we go back to our memories because at the creation of the human rights commission what happened actually Mrs. Roosevelt from the United States in uh, collaboration with uh, the man Toussaint from France they were the one heading to elaborate the commission and uh, that was read on the 10th of December, 1914. And right at, at that moment, all the continents were called to be represented. But they found that Africa was not, you know, weak enough to have any representative. Well, we had Kwame Nkrumah, many in from, from Africa, but they thought Africa had just been a goat, and they can pull left, right. And you see, this is what is happening actually in Mali. These are the results, because right from there, I remember China, when you get on uh, how it was, it came up. China even stood and said, no, we, we need to get a representative from Africa. But for West, West built on a commission, built up some, some, you know, some, 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 some laws that were only going to stand to, to, to serve some countries, the Western countries. And that was happening in Mali, actually. Because Mr. Man, Mr. Chief of the Human Rights in Mali, actually stood to get out a report like uh, if there's any country in the world that has to stand fearing gendarme or fearing police for others the in international diplomacy doesn't work like that it worked like any country seeking the best way to get up to get on his way of the to get his people on a better way but that's what happened is that he got he got a bias report he got a bias report not doing the report as the things were going on because they put on that one year group in, in cooperation with the with the malian army they have been creating doing abuses on people and all they put on these wrong reports to give a poor poor image of mali how could mali stand and these are the results that we are going to face not only for mali for many other countries because we are getting out of the world living by media by publicity by lies put up and now we are getting on the field to see the realities on the field and that's why tonight just to just to learn luis just why that's why directly tonight you are the chief of the of the Russian uh, the, the Russian diplomacy, Mr. Larov, who arrived with a very strong delegation and is going to work whatever they think about the, the one year group or whatever, and that's what is going to be carried on for all Africa. I believe that what it's a sign to, of hope for all Africa. That's my own little view to start, you know, on this, the, the comments on this. All right, uh, uh, Tagia, thanks very much for that. Uh, Kikilo Meshodeko, you are a security and risk expert. Uh, when well, you look at, uh, in July last year, 2022, United Nations uh, spokesperson was equally uh, expert or giving 42, uh, 72 hours to leave the country, and we're seeing uh, this uh, United Nations official again being given 48 hours to leave the country. And uh, summing all this together, what do you make of the security situation and the tension that continues to grow? Our uh, diplomatic tension that continue to to grow in Mali. Well, the first thing I can say is um, Mali has every right to expel anybody that they want to expel. I can say that categorically that they have every right. They can do as they please. It's their country. But I want us to always remember that whatever decisions we are making, I hope we are making it with the understanding of tomorrow. I hope we're making it with the understanding that life doesn't end now. Life doesn't end yesterday. It ends, it might end tomorrow, right? And so whatever decision this present government is making, my question to them is, give us the maybe statement or document that shows that this official was planning to destabilize your country. Let us have clarity. Don't just put words together and say this is what this person was seen doing and so therefore we are expelling the person. Let us, let, let, let things be clear. Oh, this particular person, official, he said this and it was wrong and so for this reason, considering that we are growing our nation, we want this person to leave the country and another representative to be sent in his place. Now let me add, um, this information came out on the 5th 
and by the sixth, um, um, the human rights um, group will be, that's I think uh, yesterday already sent or plans to send in another representative that is a, that is an expert, you know, like an independent expert on human rights matters um, back into the country so that they can actually talk things out. And um, interestingly, it will be he came into the country I think on the sixth. And it will be leaving on the 17th, if I'm correct, or 12th, if I'm not mixing up the dates. Um, and it shows, however, that no matter what this government is trying to do, they still need to give account. So who are you giving account to? Not just to the Malian people, but to the whole world, to let the world know that the rules of engagement that you're taking part in, you're going through the right path. That is, your soldiers are not killing people haphazardly in the north. They are not mistreating the people. They are not clamping down on protests if they want to protest or demonstrations if they want to go ahead and, uh, and do demonstrations and, and so on and so forth. So these are the issues. So if at every sneeze or if I critique the government, the first instinct of this government is to say, get out of my country because you are critiquing me, then where's the space for critics? Where's the space for opposition? Where's the space to say, you know what? Okay, fine. We fought over this. My military, you took over. You shouldn't have yada, yada, yada. Okay, now that you are there, I'm critiquing how you are going about this. And so if I critique it and the first instinct you have is to tell me, get out, you know, you're not, you're destabilizing my country because you are critiquing me, then we still have a long way to go in the thought process. That's what I have to say concerning this matter. We need to understand that it is not for now only, for tomorrow. When, when, when the military is no more in charge, what happens? When, when will we see a situation where another democratic government takes over and when there's a each again, the military comes back again, you know, so those are my, so for every um, um, official that has been expelled, what has it costed the country? First question, you know, if you ask that, okay, yeah, the stabilization attempts, how did he stabilize the country? What did he say that shouldn't have been said? And let the, let the, you know, let the people know that, oh, this kind of language will not be accepted in our country because we are trying to build something here and let that be it. But for every siege, you cannot be government. If you talk and say the government is not doing the right thing in this sector, you are immediately expelled or told to leave. Hey, it's, it's their country. They can do as they please. But I always say, always remember, there is a tomorrow in whatever decision we make. Thank you. Um, you said Elijah Inoku, uh, United Nations official giving 748 hours to leave from Mali. The opinion differs with, uh, uh, well, Kikilome believes that uh, maybe there should have been uh, some time to maybe uh, corrections to be made before uh, him being expelled. Now, in your opinion, uh, what do you think about the decision of uh, Malian authorities, uh, you know, giving 48 hours to United Nations uh, officials to leave the country? Uh, Mr. Lewis and the viewers, let's try to put things in perspective here. When Mr. Adare the reason he's been asked to leave is over the choice of a civil rights witness that he has chosen in that commission. So let's be very clear. It is not that Mali uh, does not want the human rights uh, body part of the ministry be in Mali. No. They are protesting the choice of people that he has chosen to be the witnesses in that human rights commission, especially for Mali. If you look at his latest report that he presented at the United Nations Security Council about Mali, it was particularly damning. <clears throat> and let's say this very clear. We are all for human rights. We do not want anybody to go around killing innocent people, around killing civilians, people who are not even fighting war, people who just want to go about their lives. We don't want that in any part of Africa or all over the world. But here is where the United Nations does not, I repeat, does not have the moral authority. Why do I say the United Nations does not have the moral authority? They seem to booster their ego when it comes to Africa. We see a lot of atrocities committed all over the world. We do not find the same United Nations Security Council carrying out these atrocities. I remember when this report came out on January 31st, there were already calls for war crimes to be prosecuted again. We stand with human rights. Let me say it very clear. We stand with human rights all over the world. But Africa should not be particular in pointed, pointed out damage, pulled into the mode when uh, human rights are concerned. 
It should be a one-way issue. It's good for the gays. It's also good for the gender. This is where we find the United Nations report on African countries, actually Mali and Burkina Faso and the rest of this country. That's what we find it very troubling because they seem to lose the moral high ground because they focus on Africa and we do not see the same standard applied all over the world. That is where Mali is taken back and say, hey, give me a minute. If you are going to use the same measuring yardstick, what happened here has happened elsewhere. Why is it different on the African soil? We, well, like human rights commission, development experts, we want people's human rights respected all over Africa, all over the world, in China, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Africa, but Africa should not be singled out. That's the issue here. The United Nations seems to lose its moral high ground because of the way they single out African issues. Because they were only called, as I said, if you look at that report, they were already calling for war crimes. Before you know it, these people are the age and they're going to be paraded all over the whole world as war crime criminals. But that is the same thing that's happening in many parts of the world. That should be invested, and the same people should be brought to book. Secondly, the report also indicted the White Night Group. Let me say it very clearly here I'm not a fan of the White Night Group because some of the atrocities that have carried on in Central Africa Republic for the public, if you see that it's atrocious. But again, the standards are being applied in Mali or Burkina Faso or elsewhere in Africa do not seem to be the same standard as elsewhere in the world. That is where some of us kick against and say, hey, wait a minute. Is this selective justice or is it justice being applied on the platform, on the level platform? And we look at it carefully. It is seems, it seems that these are an African issue. It, is, it appears that Africa is being singled out here. And these people, remember, these people are fighting a jihadist war. They're fighting a jihadist that is trying to the country and rule it by some religious principle, whatever it is. And if you want to send people to be in the that commission, and you do not choose people that are independent, people that are going to be uh, a spokesman for the United States or any other country, people that are going to be fair. If you do not choose those kind of people, and choose people that are going to give any reports that seems to drag the whole continent into the mud, I will not stand for it. Because that is not human right. Human right is universal. What happened in Ukraine, what happened in Russia, what happened in Libya, what happened in France, what happened in Africa should be universal. Again, it appears mad and the rest of Africa kick out against this because Africa has been targeted. That's what the problem is. Uh, Mr. Elijah, just like I highlighted Mr. Tagia, on January 31st, uh, 31st United Nations experts call for independent investigation into possible war crimes and crimes against humanity in Mali. Uh, why is the situation in Mali particular? Why is it different considering that we have crimes against humanity and war crimes committed uh, everywhere? Why the case of Mali is a bit different? Well, the case of Mali obviously is not different, but it depends on how now we African we get to stand to make things change. Because the way when it concerns Africa, the moral issues are taken up are completely, you can't understand. It's unbelievable. It's like when it concerns Africa, the heart, the emotions, are all these are caught up. But when you think of the case, just take France for the case that was brought you know, by Mali to the United Nations, uh, to the court. Until now, we haven't heard. It's like France, France, an angel. You just look at France, France, this is an angel. When, as a Cameroonian, when I think about what France did in Cameroon 55 years ago, they have been talking about and all this, but after nothing comes out. You are talking of an angel for what they, are, they did in Central African Republic, and don't just talk about Central Afri African Republic. We are talking of an angel, what they did in Algeria, you are talking of an angel, what they did in Libya, and so much. But concerning Africa, suddenly, you know, they will become very moral country. They are people of heart. They are people who love others, and the moral issues are put on and all. No, I think that is just a time to say it is not. We have to let the world understand that now the awareness has come, and the, the media, the media war, and all this like they have been doing. You can also the world now is saying that the West has lost because really war is on the field, not on media. The media that they use for time and time again to put 
of Africa to put us away, you know, from the from to wake up to awaken development issues and all this, this time has passed because we see that now uh, we tr we can understand as we always said if African media and all the other media were on already, got a few who have never known. You know the destiny that he knew. For example, so we are not in that time again of uh, where we can just sit and see impose on art some lies that take others to 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 to, to, to and all. And that's the way I remind again, just straight yesterday night, what happened is really considered in Mali as Belarov came with that strong delegation to deal on development issues, not on issues because you know we cannot talk of uh, tomorrow is going. I'm sorry to say it, that we will see tomorrow, for example, for 60 years. We've been waiting to see where African Africa is going to go. You are going to say, okay, we'll see it tomorrow. Wait and see it tomorrow. And oh, till when are we going to wait and see? You know, if the report was by, the, the, was not even by us, where are we are going? What are the results? You know, look at Niger just nearby, near Mali, and results. And also, I think the time for Africa has come to stand and say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. We have to stand and look and say the truth as they are. Let not some, and especially France or the United States and all other stuff, and talk of moral issues, talk of the heart issues, talk of emotions to let people see that we can kill, we, they can kill while we can sit and watch. And uh, the next day, when the same thing that happened to us, it's different when it's on the stage. I just think that time is not the time anymore. That time has gone through. And we, Africa, we need to stand and really get things on. And say, time to lie again has passed. Time to media lies has passed. Now the reality is that we are facing the realities and living from realities. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Um, Kikiro you are security uh, expert. Uh, on the part of Malian authorities, they say they are committed to respecting human rights and committed equally to achieve uh, some of the desires of the country. Just like you said, they are uh, as a country, they have the right to do what they want to do. But when you look at the progress that has been made uh, so far in Mali, do you think it's what uh, commendable regarding? Uh, the position that Mali is taking, they are desperate equally, just like any other country, to, you know, preserve, bring back peace, and, you know, put the country back in a stable uh, mood. Do you think they are on track and they can be commended? What progress? Um, what's your yardstick for their progress? Is it the worsening security situation where we are seeing more and more incidents occurring in the southern part of the country? Oh, so because Bamako is safe, so they're making progress. Uh, soldiers are everywhere in Bamako. Kuliko Road is under consistent threat. The threat levels for those areas continually increase. Why? While, while armed groups are closing by day, threatening checkpoints, threatening, threatening places that we normally would not have recorded incidents before. The iron side of the military is to monitor security situation nationwide. But the moment military focuses on governance, their hindsight reduces to want to play politics. I don't care who you are. If you don't have a focus of what you are good at, you will lose sight of the final goal. The military's job is to secure the borders of the country. I will shout this from the rooftops till I am tired. If the military were sure of themselves, why did they mix up with a bit of civilian people to be the prime minister, for example, or be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Why? They should have just kept it all military guys everywhere. So the fact is this, what is needed by the military to do is to secure its borders, to secure their country from foreign, foreign armed groups or from even armed groups that are already going in the country to spread. And we see that a regular base is already in January. Yangeli that required for a year suddenly shows up again. We know the tactics of the terrorists already. The military knows the tactics because they have the intelligence. But what we need to understand is what is the progress? People in Gao, People in, in your so they are the, the teachers there are going on strike. Is it in the mainstream media even in Africa, like we claim? It's not, because these are the issues. These issues have even been affecting the people during the civilian rule. So there is no progress. As much as we want to claim there is progress. That's the thing with us also as Africans. We think because the capital is fine, then it's progress. No. Progress shouldn't be stuck with only the capital. The capital is not the only place people living. People live everywhere in the country. And blessedly for Mali, they have a huge land mass and they are able to have small population. So what is stopping the government from helping its people to move from a place of that poverty, or from the place of penury to a place of prosperity? Yes, okay, fine. We say it's the imperialists. Okay, so they've evicted the imperialists. So what's stopping you? What else? 
So what's your next move after evicting the imperialists like you claim? What are you doing different from the previous governments? What are you doing different? What's the progress level? The number of incidents we have recorded just between January and today has increased compared to what we saw just even last year and not to talk of two years ago. I will keep repeating this until we understand that there is a focus that needs to be made. The military cannot handle politics and at the same time handle security. They're not schizo. They can handle one thing at a time. We all have our capacities. We all have our advantages. So for you to say if there is a progress, I don't know where the progress is. Maybe the other speakers can tell me where the progress is. The fact that we can expel people, if that is the progress, oh, great. Then it means, so oh, we have a stance. If that's the progress, great. But how does that better the life of the Malian people? Has that stopped people from going on strike? Doctors were supposed to go on strike yesterday. But what happened? They were strong armed and immediately the, the, the strike thing looked scattered already. And that's what the military do, use force. How can't we get that already in Africa? We are facing that problem in other parts of Africa already. Then we, we want to look outward to our problems. We are not looking inwards. You need to understand if everybody focuses on what is their business, if the ministers are doing the right thing, if people that are supposed to hold positions are doing the right thing, then we will not have these conversations we are talking about moralist of what other countries are doing and so it shouldn't be the measure. Nobody said anybody should be the measure. But they have been able to accept for whatever reason whatsoever, maybe at the expense of us Africans. Yes, of course. But for us to still stay on that and say we are not using that as a leverage to be better for ourselves and continue to use the same patterns that we use, the same force, the same system of clamping down on people, not allowing them to express themselves as the measure to make sure that we should be our progress, then maybe we shouldn't be having this conversation. We should leave the military to keep progressing like you guys claim. So if there is progress, maybe the other speakers will be able to show us that the fact that they can expel officials when they are not um, feeling them, as the case may be. The fact that even in Bamako now, you can have a kidnapping or coring, and sometimes you don't even do a kidnapping or court like a week later. We are money on the data that comes from these countries. We are the ones that see these things as clearly as they are. And gladly, it's not in the foreign um, um, stations that are, you know, it's the local, it's the local media that's letting us know what is happening in their country. So why can't we as Africans step back and look at what is happening and say, oh, there's a difference of what is happening here. What is different? What has happened? Why is there now a lacune in this area? When we are talking about Likoro, even where the military camp is, is not safe. So what are we talking about? So we stay in Bamako and think everything is all right until another big um, um, jihadist hit. Well, maybe if there's progress, maybe the other speakers will have that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kikilomo Shodeko. Uh, let's hear from you, Mr. Elijah. Based on what Kikilo Mel said, uh, insecurity has doubled compared to a year before now or two years before now. And this is with regards to maybe the fact that Mali has cut ties with France, probably uh, expelling maybe Operation Baham and all that. Do you think actually the reason why insecurity has returned in Mali is because of uh, possibly the security decisions that Mali has taken? taken recently to cut ties with possible fronts? Let me disagree with, uh, I mean, uh, politely with my colleague from Nigeria. Let me, let's put things back a little bit. Why were the bar, Operation Paracam being expelled? Why is the minister having an issue with Mali and so on? Let us understand that the jihadists that are fighting in Mali are not Europeans. So when we talk about why, you know, peace and so on. These are Malians. So the jihadists in the north are Malians. They are not Europeans. They are not Americans. They are not foreign bodies. Secondly, MINUSCO met before they were being expelled Operation Barakan, the people of Barakan. They made a press conference and said openly that they are not able to handle the jihadists. You can go and read it. Yeah, statements. They said they were not able to handle jihadists. If they're not able to handle jihadists, why are you in the country? You were there to fight jihadists. You were there to fight them. It's true, this is a battle of it, it's a real consolation and dialogue in the country, the human rights and so on. But Operation Barkhane was there to fight these jihadists for years. They couldn't do anything, so why were they in the country? If you are the president of that country, will you still take them? When they have said they are not able to get rid of jihadists and they can't do anything about it? Of course not. Means they have a different ulterior motive being there. If you have openly said the mission for me you were brought, you need to carry it out, you can't do it, 
do not have the capability to do it, then leave. It's simple as that. So they had nowhere to go than to leave. I mean, the, Malian, the hands of the Malian Junta were tied, and people say that they were brought here, they can't do anything, then you're keeping them. The population rose up and say, you know what? These people say they cannot drive out the jihadis, they can't fight the jihadis, then what are they doing here? So the government had nothing else than to kick them out. So let's put things in perspective here. So it's not because they drove out uh, Franks and the Reds that insecurity has risen. It has always been like that. They has, remember, Malian territory is very vast. And according to the latest standards, if I remember what I read so far, not long ago, more than, uh, I think, one third or two thirds of the country, can't remember the number, it's in the hands of the jihadists. Just like you mentioned yourself, Morocco is fine. It doesn't mean that the rest of the country is fine. This is Georgia all over the place. So again, we do not, we are not here saying praising the military junta, that's the way Africa should go. But this happened for a reason. It happened because of the incapability of the uh, the civilian government that was there to do anything about the security situation in the country. And the foreign powers that were there openly declared that they are unable to do anything in the country. And where were they there? They were there for the minerals and the rest of the sources that were exploited. So the country had no other thing to do than to expel them. So let's put them in perspective. Now, as to whether they are progressing or actually uh, keeping peace in the country and so on, that's something still to be said. We are monitoring the situation as well. Things are happening in that country. They seem to progress, but in security. But again, this is a message I've always given to a lot of African countries. You do not win the war. You can't smoke out guns. There's this African philosophy or uh, I know that by 2020, if I remember, they will stop smoking guns. We talk of dialogue. I have said this. An, an example of not long ago, the Imam of Bamako had a meeting with a jihadist. He took, I mean, authority from the and said he wants to have a discussion with the jihadist. They had a meeting. And out of that meeting, there was some agreement that they agreed on. And we saw relative peace, humanitarian corridor was created, and people were able to give him food. That is a glimpse, and that's an idea to show you that the problems in Africa will not be resolved through the battle of the guard. It will resolve the negotiated terror. You could call for terrorists. You could give them one name give. By the end of the day, they're going to sit on the negotiated table and discuss their issue. That is what I have been pushing. Whether it is Cameroon, whether it's Burkina Faso, whether it is Mali, whatever Central African Republic, any country in Africa that's going through a crisis, they are not going to resolve it through the battle of the guard. It's an ideology. The jihadist movement is an ideology. You do not kill an ideology with the battle of the guard. You take out power in that ideology. And you make them see a different route. And that is what you bring peace into that country. So again, let's give the military junta a chance to show what they are worth of. And again, if it comes a time when these people are not able to deliver to the population, the same rioting that took out the France, France and the rest of the country is going to happen in the country. Let's remember the time of uh, Thomas Kansai, who was a military leader in Burkina Faso. That is one of the most progressive, peaceful times that that country has ever had. If you look at the country of Mali and Burkina Faso, these countries have had relative peace, relative history, relative peace. Peace per se has always eluded them. But a military leader came over, instituted peace and progress. So let's give these people a chance and they'll prove themselves. It is very uh, unfair to be judging because they are military leaders. It is, they are military leaders, yes, but they are military leaders but only one all over the world that have shown what they are able to do. Let's give them a chance. That's what I'm saying. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah Inoko. Uh, Mr. Tagia, can dialogue bring peace in Mali regarding the situation? And uh, can the Malian authorities, being military, be able to uh, manage power as well as fight insecurity? Well, Luis, uh, I don't think that we are here to. So dialogue has always been the solution among human beings to take things ahead. Dialogue, dialogue, but you dialogue uh, with someone that can recognize also the power of your views and all that. What is what can, what dialogue can bring is on the table, everybody's respected. And I don't think that what, anyway, I will have even like to start by this word, Janta. 
Janta is not really the word that we Africans we put, should put to be in our mind because Janta already means, you know, a way of pushing or forcing yourself, with, which is not the mentality that these military people, this military group came in uh, Mali to bring forward. They are just there for some time and they gave clearly the program of what they are there for. So they are not going, they are not just there for power. And at the same time, I'd just like to remind that uh, when, when, we are, when we are talking about the issues of Mali, you know, let us get away from the way the West have, has put in our minds, you know, looking at the world as a perfect world. We are not in a perfect world. And um, looking at the perfect world, that means normally the military should stand and do this and leave civilian to rule the country. As I said again before, Mali has been trying that for years and years, never got any results. Now, sitting and talking just after some time of what are the results, what is the progress, and all, I say, please, let us give them some time. Let us give them some time. And, you know, when, when you go back power, you take program, let them be given a time to show them. Now, if at the time of what they promise to leave power, they don't leave it. That's where the problem starts. And I don't think that John has ever said that they come there to become eternal. Now, others who respond, we have heard that many times, again, before, in other countries, that never leave. But I say, let us give them, you know, the, 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 the benefits of the doubt. Let us leave them, do it, and we see what it can come out. Because the hope of all in Africa has always been a civilian government. But if you have on, on, on in the government people who are puppets, of the West, people that are put by the West, that are influenced by the West. You, are, you cannot talk of a political government on that way that is there really for the good of the people. And that's what the, 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 the military, the group of military that is there, okay, call it junta as they have put in our ears, are there to do, to go ahead and get on the table of negotiation, sit down and see what, you know, just as uh, Mr. Elijah brought it so much up and I like that way, you know, the minister really recognize with Barkhan that they couldn't do, they couldn't do the job. And we Africans, we sit down and make like our issues, we don't know our issues. What are the jihadists? They are Malians. They are Malians. And what are the reality on the fields? That the foreigners will come and say that they can settle. They are Malians, the Malians, the, 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 the military, the junta, they know them. They know how they function. And that what they want to bring, you know, they want to bring that uh, the, 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 those those knowledge up to settle the issues and leave the political a civilian government that has been voted by Malians without any influence of the West. And that why again, that why again, I appreciate, I pray that participation of an alternative before there was no alternative. Before there was no alternative, but now West has seen that there is an alternative. We can see with Russians, we can see with Chinese and all. And that's all the problem the Russians have at the moment. And that we have to be careful, Africa, not to understand all the battle, the geopolitical behind. And just fall, you know, that good, good, some wonderful theories of perfect world. We are not in a perfect world. The world is still at a jungle where it has been. I'm not even saying that Russia is the best that we can have in partners, but what Malians are trying to do is to get in realities, the reality of that we are living today. And that again, as I said, getting out of the media's noise, the media's news and all that has always been put on. Now you have like France losing the cake that they took, they had from Africa. And now to my sister, I can just give you some two examples to learn off. I remember when uh, this is taking away the case of uh, of Mali. I remember when we we had a problem of transportation 20 years ago in Cameroon. And the, 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 the first motorcycle coming from uh, China's came. What the news that the media put on from the West was they were weak motors. That was to push forward the motorcycle that they were not even producing. They were taking the Yamaha's products, coming and increasing, doubling, tripling the prices and selling to people. While Chinese were now getting it, everybody could afford it. And suddenly today, the transportation issues are settled all over Africa, right deep in the villages, you see motors doing it. I can take examples, examples over that. So let us not do things as if we are in a perfect world. We are not in a perfect world, and the West doesn't like even the perfect world. The, the, the West will make laws that they, can, that they cannot they cannot respect themselves. And I land by saying the same thing, like uh, let them not put morals and take some standards, moral standards that need to be respected. But only for Africa. That's how land. Let it be all elsewhere. Respect and therefore the world will work on that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh,
free authorities a chance to see what they can possibly achieve. We keep an eye on that, actually. And meantime, we're looking at Burkina Faso is seeking to form a federation with neighboring Mali in order to unite efforts to overcome the common challenges facing the two uh, countries uh, with regards to enhancing their economic potential for joint influence. Uh, Kikilome Shodoko, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso seeking to form a federation, both countries face the same uh, security challenges, and both countries, of course, we understand that have cut ties with uh, their former colonial uh, master France. So what do you think a federation between Mali and Burkina Faso will mean with regards to the present security situation, as well as uh, benefiting them economically? Kikinomo, you have to put on your microphone, sorry. Before I proceed with this particular topic, you made mention of me referring to Operation, the reason Operation Barcane was the reason why the security situation has deteriorated or that line of thought. Not once in my conversation did I mention Operation Barcane. So you put words in your mouth and you gave the other speaker his own speech to talk about. I don't do that. I'm clear with what I said. My attack is on the military of Mali. Not once I talk about any foreign counterparts. If the military of Mali cannot handle the security situation of Mali, then they don't have a business being in government in Mali. It's as simple as that. So whatever counter argument that comes from that relating to Operation Barkane or whoever, Wagner Group, I, I never said anything like that. My authority, my own understanding is to talk about the, the the armed forces of Mali. Any other person outside that, that is not my concern. My concern is the armed forces of Mali and what they are able to do in their country to, to secure the lives and properties of the people. Now, moving to the situation of federation with Burkina Faso. Now, my first question is, Burkina Faso in itself, is it Burkina Faso that is seeking this federation or Mali? So if it's Burkina Faso, it means that the, the military head of states that is there is feeling overwhelmed. And so he's feeling like he can have a link with Mali to be able to kind of handle the whole issues that is happening in this country. You see, that is a problem in itself. When you want to take over power, right, and you don't go through the works of using your brain to understand the situation of your country, you sit down, you say, okay, in this space, in my sitting area, what is the problem? I need lights. I need water, I need this, I need that. But when your first instinct is force, when your first instinct is guns, you forget the reason why you are taking over. And that I think that is what has happened with Burkina Faso's um, security head at the, pro, uh, at the person in charge of Burkina Faso. So now they are seeking a federation with Mali in a way that will kind of shock the responsibility that they are supposed to take over in their country. So Burkina Faso is facing the same thing. Large landmass, uh, small population, they can't handle the threats and the issues that Rush was, Kabore was trying to figure out one step at a time, creating different avenues, creating things, making things come together. So these are the issues actually. So you as a military person, a captain, a colonel or whatever, you sit in your barracks and all of a sudden you feel your, your guns give you the power that you have to take over forgetting that there are issues in your country that are way beyond the surface of what you're looking at. There are the, govern, the, the governing issues in the local areas, the villages, you know, those little compartments. Then we now talk of the bigger cities and we now talk of now the, the country at large. And so that's why we have all the different compartments. We have the, the um, we, 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 we have all those small places. We have the local governments. We have the village heads. We have all those things. So that from the smallest iota of things, things can begin to evolve and grow and be better. Right. But what happens is everybody wants to stay in the capital and dictate to what happens to the local areas without understanding the peculiarity of what is happening in local areas, without understanding the things that are disturbing the people in the local areas. And this is a general problem across Africa. So great, they are in the federation. Nigeria is currently supposed to be a federation, but we know what's going on is the same issue. The capital is where the decisions come from, forgetting that the, the, the people on the street, the bottom people, there are different dynamics at play. And so it's the same thing. So Burkina Faso now hiring a federation with Mali. Okay, before I even go on with my rant, 
it's a great idea. Collaboration is my thing. I love it. I love the idea of collaboration. And if it was the if it was the whites that we're breaking, we we're bringing us together by force, we would have clamored and said no, because we don't want this and we don't want that. Now two big countries want to come. Well, the other big country wants a federation with another one. Hmm, collaboration is a great thing, but why a federation? Why can't you run your country and look at the other country? Maybe they're doing things right you might not be doing and try to engage them. Collaboration means you travel back and forth between each other. You have good um, um, correspondence, good communication to better your country. But until we understand that our countries are not just the capital. The capital is not the whole of Burkina Faso. The capital is not the whole of Mali. The capital is not the whole of Nigeria. The capital is just an iota. Little challenges to continue communicating with uh, Kikilome. We hope that we are able to re-establish connections with uh, meantime. Let's hear from you, Mr. Elijah Noko. Is a federation between Mali and uh, Burkina Faso possible? And what do you think this is going to mean to both countries who are facing a similar security situations, economic advantages will be what they are seeking to achieve? What do you think and how possible can a federation be? Uh, Mr. Elijah Inoko, we are still hoping to equally establish connections with you. Uh, let's hear from you, Mr. Tage from Hong Kong. Uh, Burkina Faso authorities approached Malian authorities recently in a bid to seek cooperation between these two countries. Federation is what is possibly on the table. From the look of things, do you think a federation is possible between Mali and Burkina Faso? And what would this mean regarding, uh, considering that both countries face the same uh, insecurity situations and they are hoping to you know enhance the economy for the betterment of the two countries well, answer to the, you give the answer to your question because collaboration between the two countries they are facing the same security issue that is share of experience and all but mostly one thing that we have to see common army mm. you know the common army that means an, an army that is uh, more capacities and more, you know, as I said, more, more exchange of experience. But at the same time, as uh, just my, our co-panel just said, I am the man of the collaboration. The world is going through uh, a move, a win, a win of uh, getting together, a unity. The mondialization is all about unity. That's why you have the European Union. That is not very successful. That's why you have already, like you see the gilets jaunes in France already is shining, that you know, get get off the Uni European Union. You had in, you had the, 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 the British, you had off and all. But one thing is sure, when you come to stand many, as uh, the word of God we say, you know, getting many, you are, you always become stronger, and that's what I think uh, Burkina Faso and uh, Mali want to want, want 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 to play on. You have also the BRICS that are really threatening you know, all the power that the West has been for putting on for for years, and they, they know it. And uh, I, I just think that it's something wonderful they can get together. They have common issues. They have been colonized by the same colonial master. So they, they can have a really a good share of experience. And that really frightened the West. I think so. And uh, going on that same base, we'll be, we'll be moving towards the dream of Gaddafi. That is an African Union, a real African Union, a real Africa coming together. Uh, together to fight because as I again repeat as you said before we are in the jungle if there's nothing about flowers out there there's nothing about moral issues out there nothing nothing like that these are all lies to exploit us or to make, uh, make us think Africa Africa none of the Western countries love us they are not out for love they are there to exploit us let us get organized to to, 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 to stand together to face the battle the world is battles again as i said because we are in a jungle we are not out for dreams and all that they try to put in our minds and all so really i, I it is to be applause it's really to to praise you get in uh, mali and burkina faso together as i said again that will mean common army so this is something to to praise okay um let's try to re-establish connections with uh, those on zoom kiki no maybe before we Lots of connections you were sharing those uh, point. Maybe we we'll give you a chance to continue. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. So what I was saying is the idea of collaboration is not a bad thing. 
right? That's not my issue. But the idea of federations, we know it hasn't worked in Africa thus far. The larger the countries, the more difficult it is for the leaders to actually handle the situations internally. Uh, yeah, I heard um, the person at the our speaker at the studio talking about it scares the West when we are bigger. We in Africa, I think we live so much in dreamland and we don't understand our issues. We don't like we don't concretize our issues. Like we we so much don't get ourselves enough. I will say it again. All of us, most of us, lives live in cities, right? And so we have that ideology of how cities are, right? They, but there are people in the villages that have been neglected for years. They don't have water. Even the cities, I can put Nigeria in perspective. I can even say the Francophone African countries have some water. They, they're doing okay when it comes to a bit of infrastructure. Not for us in Nigeria, for example, right? Infrastructure, you have to deal with that on your own. So, yes, great idea that they want to become a federation. But in the long run, it is not a great idea. They can collaborate. But that federation thing causes a problem because they will break apart in the sense of they won't be able to handle the situations in the smaller places. The cities will be focused on and whatever goals and dreams and whatever seem like the cities are working. But the villages, the smaller compartments will not work. We see that consistently already in our countries in Africa. We see some villages that have been forgotten, no electricity, no water. Now, you now imagine what happens when a big country like Burkina and Mali comes together and say they are forming a federation, except, except the meaning of federation has changed, right? I, I, when I first saw the information some days back, I actually thought they were talking about sports, you know? I was like, oh, they're trying to form a federation, a sports federation? Um, but realizing that is actually a governmental style of system where you have every region running on their own capacity and, you know, dealing with the center that is a center. Great idea. If they can handle themselves like the United States, that would be spectacular. But we know how Africa runs and we know how the leaders are not always up to task when it comes to those key decisions to be made. I wish so much that we begin to actually put in place that people that are technocrats, that understand the situations in their small locations, local government, villages, the communes, the towns, and we begin to grow from those compartments because actually we are overwhelmed at the moment to deal with larger spaces. We can do smaller to bigger. I think until we can manage those smaller compartments and grow little by little, where each of our towns and villages can grow and we can have the proper amenities to actually grow those areas, I think that would be a great idea. But for now, for me, Burkina Faso's idea of a federation with Mali, I know it will not work, one, and I know Mali will not agree to it, too. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kikilo Meshoneko. Let's hear from you, Mr. Elijah Inoko, your researcher with Flix University on Africa Development. Uh, the proposal of uh, Burkina Faso suggesting that uh, both countries, Burkina Faso and Mali, form a federation in a bit to deal with their common issues like insecurity and boost the economy between the both countries. Naki Kilome highlights the aspect of uh, knowing how vast Mali and Burkina Faso are and uh, the fact that there's much to take into consideration when talking about federation. Do you think it's possible? Is this federation possible? And uh, what do you think this is going to mean uh, for both countries? Let me surprise a lot of you. I think yes. yes. I'm going to explain myself. Because when we are talking about this issue, uh, I think the historical context, people need to understand the historical context. This war in Burkina Faso, she had this war in Burkina Faso, in Mali, a little bit of it in Chad, a little bit of it in Niger, is as a result of the fall of Libya. And those, when Libya fell, those people were fighting with Mali, the Quarics, the Awazajid, all those people took arms from Mali and ran down south. When they ran down south, they started destabilizing Burkina Faso, Mali, and even Chad. The issue that we're having in Chad. So this is a common jihadist war. And if you have a common jihadist war, and you have a federated state, federated state fighting a common enemy, it will be much more successful than a single country taking on these other people, taking on the enemy by itself. Number two, the jihad is a common ideology and a common route. 
And you're going to find them to succeed. You have to take a, the same common ideology and common route. Number two, the jihadists are cutting off humanitarian corridors in the whole of that northern zone. And if you have to create, my colleague from Nigeria just talked about the villages and so on. That is what something like traditions would have those villages because they are far away in the north. It's not in Bamako, it's not in Ouagadougou that the war is being for. It's in those villages that you're crying for. So it's coordinated effort to fight these people in the northern region is going to actually help the villages that you just talked about. Number five, if you look at what happened, because we do have power. Let's understand this. Understand it in historical context. There are the villages. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. We are suffering. So when the rose of the rest of the population rose up and said, this government was elected to fight the jihadists, but they're not doing anything about it. That is how the military junta came to power. So let's understand the historical context that the people that you're calling the villages and so on, those are the people that rose up against the government that wanted a different kind of leadership. So number six, the African continent as a whole has been clamoring for some sort of a conglomerate. We've been clamoring for free trade. They've been clamoring for some sort of a body that is going to stand as one, because as we know here right now, the African Union is a totally bulldog. They're not doing anything. So if you have those regional blocks that are going to come together, again, when they talk of federation, it's not a fusion of Mali and Burkina Faso to become one big country. No, that's not what the Malian and Prime Minister and Burkina Faso Prime Minister were discussing. They're talking about a conglomerate where they'll come together and coordinate their efforts in the economy, in security, in education, in the whole of that region so that they can fight a common enemy. And I would say, guys, go for it. Go for it. Any sort of effort that is going to garner the efforts of the regional bloc, and whether you're talking about security, whether you're talking about education, whether they're talking about the economy, whether they're talking about transportation, whether they're talking about infrastructure. Even look at the whole of that northern region of Ozaka. Infrastructure is close to zero. That is why the United Nations itself is finding a lot of difficulties to put a humanitarian corridor in food and medicine to those villages that my colleague in Nigeria has been hammering on. They cannot even provide them because the charities have blocked the road they do not have a means of creating that corridor to help those people. So a common effort that we can bring in charge and here, it's not just end end with uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, that is going to create that humanitarian corridor to help those villages. It's going to go a long way. So I will encourage this country to go for that idea. It's a good idea. It's going to improve trade. It's going to improve a lot of things. It's instead going to fight against this clandestine harvesting of minerals. Because that's what the West is doing. They are operating in the dark. And there is no openness to what's happening in those regions. That's why we have bauxite, aluminum, and all these minerals. We call it black diamonds. That's what's happening. But if we have this kind of a conflict, a conglomerate, a confederation, whatever name you want to give it. But again, I want to make clear that they are not asking for a fusion of those two countries to work big countries. They're asking for a conglomerate of those countries to come together and form a regional body that will release his power to that regional block so that they coordinate their efforts and bring security, education, uh, human and color and fight the jihadists or even not fighting, come to and understand what the jihadists want and they can even come to a dialogue on the table. But if you find an enemy, you've never sat with them. You don't know who they are. You've never talked with them. You guys are looking through guns. It will go forever and ever. Even look at the history of these countries, ladies and gentlemen. Mali and Burkina Faso and the rest of the countries in that Sahel region, especially these two, have had little peace. They have relative peace. It's been one problem to the other, to the other, to the other. Go and read their history. They have, they've had relative peace, not real peace in the, in the recess of the world. So if these countries can do anything that's going to bring stability, bring peace, help those villages that my colleagues have been talking about, let them go for it. That is my suggestion. Let them go for it. It's not a bad idea. It's a good idea. Uh, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Elijah. Mr. Uh, Tiger, any more comments to that before we... we... 
Yeah. I, really, I think that we said our best about that. I we have to really praise that uh, that collaboration. Let us call it collaboration. But this world that come on that came on a conglomerate for that is coming together. Mm -hmm. It is something that we have been dreaming for long in Africa, and really, you know, seeing uh, encouraging. You know the regionalization. That is the the, the kind of uh, our our regional organizations, like in Central Africa, Western Africa, and you can see that this could have been work go further and very very strong in the West Africa, without the the case of uh, the puppet that we have in uh, in Ivory Coast. It could have worked. So you know now Mali and Burkina Faso they are just trying to correct that because we have one Ivory Coast that try with uh, the man to stand to some out but this the, 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 the way ahead the way ahead to get really uh, this kind of unity we are doing all together in africa that is not we are not talking of really the same case like uh, federation nigerian food federation as we some may think and uh, we are talking here really of a kind of collaboration and exchange of experience as uh, we, just, we just said, between countries and uh, having a West West African regional organization, a strong one, having one in South Africa, having one in West, in uh, Central Africa, and another one, that will be going to bring Africa to really stand powerful. And I think that's, uh, that's simply the example Burkina Faso and Mali are trying to, to, bring, to, to, to bring on. And again, as uh, other panelists just explained again, the sharing of experience and having, again, as I said on one part, the common, a common army that cannot be called, but they, they have experience, they have the same experiences that are going to stand for them to help them to get things really ahead. Okay. I think that's something we have to praise. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tagia from Hong Kong. You are a human rights advocate. We want to thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Luis. And uh, just uh, these comments, uh, this extract, extract from uh, the comments of the Prime Minister of Burkina Faso, it reads, Mali is a major producer of cotton, cattle, and gold. Burkina Faso also produces cotton, cattle, and gold, the Prime Minister said, as uh, quoted by his office, so long as we each take separate parts, we don't have much influence. But if we put Mali, uh, Mali's and Burkina Faso's production of cotton, gold, and cattle together, it becomes a powerhouse. We're looking forward to see a possibility of a federation, and let's see how the outcome looks like. Kike Lome Shodeko, you are a senior risks and uh, security expert. We appreciate your time. Thanks for being a part of the program. Thank you so very much. We also had Mr. Elijah Nwoko. You are a researcher with uh, Leeds University uh, on Africa development. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all for the uh, different opinions we so much appreciate that we invite you to stay tuned more programs are yours on africa media it's bye bye for now stay with us